Hello and welcome back to another engaging edition of the Workflow Webinar Cafe series presented by Symphony AI. I'm Tim Laws, Senior Director of Solutions at Symphony AI, and today we're thrilled to delve into the topic of decision intelligence for the IT service desk, a topic that's important to today's rapid evolving digital landscape. Joining us for this insightful discussion is none other than Tim McElgan, a distinguished principal analyst at TMT Advisory. Tim brings a wealth of expertise to the table with a career marked by extensive research and strategic advisory in various technology domains. He has extensive and varied experience in research and technology focused market studies and providing strategic advice across IT enterprise service management, IT support, contact center operations, human resources and benefits, and telecommunications. <clears throat> His career includes senior analysts and editorial positions at Informa Tech, Bloomberg Law, Straightcast Partners, Frost and Sullivan, and Gartner. Tim's perspectives are both seasoned and forward thinking. Welcome, Tim. Thanks very much, Tim. Fellow Tim. It's great to be here. Yeah, always nice to have another Tim in the room. <laughs> well, let's get started. Um, so, Tim, let's start by setting the scene for this webinar. First, how would you rate the current quality of IT service desk analytics and reporting? And secondly, what decision intelligence, what is decision intelligence and how will it help IT service desk leaders? Right, so I think, uh, you know, it's somewhat of an obvious statement, but, but the state of uh, uh, analytics um, is mixed. Um, and it really, uh, it's not so much uh, the tools, I think, as, as how they're used. Um, a relatively simple tool used very well will do a better job than a very complex tool used poorly. Um, and I think that, you know, the way I think about it is if the tools that are being used don't enable the maximum number of possible good outcomes, either the tools or how they're being used is not suited to the, the, the specific requirements, right? Because every, uh, every service desk, every IT department is different. Every uh, enterprise is different in the way that they use those tools. Um, and, and I mean, the, the current generation of tools is, is almost incomprehensibly powerful. I think that that's, you know, uh, uh, literally incomprehensibly for me uh, in terms of, you know, what's going on sort of beyond uh, behind the, the hood. Um, so what I'd say is, regardless of the tool, you really need to understand what are the outcomes you're going for? Um, have a decent level of certainty about what resources are available to your team and to the enterprise more largely, um, and have an idea of what resources are going to be required in the near term and in the longer term, and then finally have a reasonable clarity on how you're going to obtain those resources. So I think those are the things that the tools really need to enable. Um, you know, the details are important, uh, but at the end of the day, this is more about um, uh, process, procedure, and uh, goals and, and mission. Uh, than necessarily about the tool itself. The tool is a, a very, very powerful assistant to the human beings who are going to get this stuff done. Um, of course, a lot of service desks out there are still relying on on very basic metrics and traditional reporting me metric me methods, excuse me. Um, and those can tell you quite clearly what's already gone wrong. Uh, they're, they're sort of a rear view mirror in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you're reacting, you're not proactive. Um, they're much less useful in predicting how things are going to go wrong in the future. Um, you know, what's coming down the pike? What's uh, um, what are some of the, the sort of hidden problems that are that are there, but not necessarily coming to the top of the reporting stack? Um, because a lot of times you're just putting out fires, right? Everybody's reacting to uh, you know the, the the help desk tickets, the uh, the desperate calls from somebody. Um, and, and they're not really uh, looking down the road and saying, okay, we see this is coming. Let's let's take care of this before the user ever has a reason to, uh, you know, hit their keyboard or pick up the phone. So I think that those are the, um, you know, the capabilities that are that are really uh, most powerful and that are enabled by uh, this newest uh, generation of, of tools. Um, but you know, if you're building these tools from the inside out, kind of starting from what the tool can do. Uh, rather than what the stakeholders outside of IT itself actually need them to do, um, you know, you've got a problem. And I think if, you know, somebody disagrees with that perspective, take a look at how the tools you're using capture the insights in terms of what those user needs are. 
uh, if they're, you know, if that's not a major uh, sort of feature of a um, IT service management tool to capture the user experience and, um, you know, in, uh, enable improvements in that experience, um, you know, that that I think is a, is a pretty good sign that you're, um, you're you need to to reinvestigate the tools that you're using, and I, and I would argue if your vendor can't tell you what why a given feature that they're going to offer to you matters specifically to your organization, um, you know they they really uh, you need to challenge them on that uh, because at the end of the day you know I think that when you're talking about tools that are so central now to every uh, you know uh, modern enterprise in terms of, you know, a digital uh, workplace, um, you really need to know that your vendor understands not just your, not even your your vertical, but, you know, specifically, how do you operate uh, in the market, um, you know, yourself? So I think that those are the, um, those are kind of the, the, the key considerations that I would uh, advise folks to take a look at. Um, now, decision intelligence is, is really uh, kind of a blend of human and tool, right? Um, really, decision intelligence is more of a uh, discipline than a technology. Uh, it's more about you know maximizing the critical role of human judgment, human experience, intuition uh, in eliciting and interpreting and continuously reassessing data-driven insights that are generated by these systems, by these tools that we're using. And while those technologies provide incredibly valuable information and recommendations um, based on data analysis, uh, based on, um, you know, uh, pattern recognition, all the things that these very, very fast, high horsepower uh, machines are capable of. At the end of the day, human decision makers are the ones who are bringing those unique capabilities to the decision making process um, that's powered by, but so far at least uh, not replaceable by technology solutions. So, um, you know, human decision makers, they, they possess Contextual knowledge. There's an understanding of the broader business environment that influences this decision making. Um, but what we don't have is the ability to absorb at scale the amount of data that uh, every modern enterprise deals with. So it's not just data about you know sort of uh, what's going on in our uh, teams, uh, what's what's uh, what's working, what's broken. Uh, it's also what's happening out in the greater world. I mean you know things like uh, you know conflict in Ukraine can in fact. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, excuse me, um, uh, supply chains, it can impact, um, you know, partnerships, it can impact all of that stuff. And while that seems a little bit high level, at the end of the day, it can really impact whether or not we can deliver the services that our, our, our users need. So um, that's where uh, I think that uh, technology and automation has so much power because it can absorb and make sense of those massive kinds of patterns that uh, human beings, you know, simply uh, aren't able to to see. Uh, so we we bring in that horsepower, we apply the human capabilities to it, and you end up with uh, decision intelligence. There's, you know, there's specific um, skill sets and, and um, uh, processes that go into it. There's a, a thing called a causal decision diagram, which basically asks, if we do this, what will be the outcome? Or uh, if we're trying to get to that outcome, what are the things that we need to do to accomplish that, to, 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 to reach that outcome? And that's really what decision intelligence is about. And what's really powerful about it is by its nature, decision intelligence is collaborative. It requires uh, bringing in the largest group possible of stakeholders and giving them uh, a, a framework in which you can discuss disagree, argue, and then eventually come to an agreement that this is, in fact, you know, how we want to move forward. These are our goals. Uh, we now all understand and agree that these are the resources that are required. Here's how we're going to go get them. Uh, and then the other thing that's really powerful about it is flexibility. And you know, we hear about agile all the time in the context of, of development. But I think agility in the larger context is really important, which is to say, Things are constantly changing. Uh, you've got people coming and going in terms of your staff. You've got uh, new technologies being introduced, and we all know how much fun that can be. Uh, you know, when there's a uh, a new generation of tech that's brought to bear. So, um, having structure uh, and and a set of uh, processes and a discipline uh, around decision intelligence, and then applying the massive power that these tools bring uh, is is an incredibly um, 
powerful and, and capable kind of um, uh, capability for uh, for the modern enterprise. Excellent, thank you. Second question: What factors are present? Are sorry. What factors are preventing companies from succeeding with IT service desk analytics and reporting? Well, you know, I, I started to, to, to uh, as I was kind of making notes in preparation for this conversation, um, I had a lack of quality data. And then I realized that that sort of contradicts what I just finished talking about, the masses of data that are out there. Uh, but I think the word quality is, is the important part, right? Um, Incomplete, inaccurate data, you're going to end up with unreliable insights. You're going to be making decisions based on uh, incorrect or, or most most often outdated uh, kind of information. Um, but uh, the flip side of that, of course, is that even, uh, you know, an overabundance of data, no matter how quality, you know, how, how high the quality of that data uh, and, and completeness and accuracy uh, is also can be overwhelming. So I think, you know, having tools that um, allow you to see the patterns uh, that that are uh, you know present uh, in the data surface those insights and then share them across uh, all the different operations that are involved in a, in a modern enterprise uh, sort of in the language in which they speak right I mean that that's something I've talked about a lot during my career if you're talking to the CFO you better be able to speak finance and if you're talking to the facilities folks you better be able to speak you know uh, logistics so um, I think that the flexibility of the, the, the new tools, where it's not just one dashboard for everyone, right? Um, where everybody's going to have the exact same view, have the same data, have the same truth that everybody's operating from, but be able to put that into context uh, uh, of the, the various functions across the enterprise. And that's where it moves from ITSM and into enterprise service management, which I think is, you know, uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. There are a few enterprises out there that have successfully implemented ESM. But I think over the next, uh, you know, uh, certainly five, six, ten years, um, the ability to effectively um, accomplish real enterprise service management uh, is going to be absolutely critical to, to longer term success for most enterprises. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, we talk a lot about silos, right? Siloed data sources. Um, there's data fragmentation across all these different systems. I just wrote a, an article recently that you know looked at a. Uh, um, it was actually something that uh, Roy Roy Atkinson, who you know well, uh, shared with yeah. me about a, a construction company, and you know it was a global construction company. So they've got projects of massive size going on all over the world at the same time. Um, so you can imagine how difficult it is to make decisions about, you know, where are we taking this company if everyone can't see what's going on in terms of where are the delays, where are uh, materials getting hung up, um, all of that stuff. And they couldn't. Everybody was looking at their individual projects. Uh, so they were really having a tough time staying on, on, on schedule and staying on budget. Um, by building a centralized dashboard that everybody could see everything, you know, obviously within uh, authorization limits, um, they were able to to make that a much smoother and more effective process uh, and, and stay on schedule much more effectively and stay on budget, um, you know, much more consistently. So those are the types of things I think that that these tools and these analytics um, and and reporting and display dashboards, et cetera, um, really are, are incredibly powerful for. Um, and by breaking down or by attacking those silos, you're also attacking human silos, right? We all have a tendency to want to own our little piece of the pie, uh, piece of the puzzle, and maintain control over that. And that's kind of a natural human, uh, you know, uh, reaction. But it's it's really critical uh, in a modern uh, workplace that those silos, those human silos get broken down. The only way you do that is by sharing insights and saying, hey, this worked for us. I'm not telling you what to do. And I think IT has a reputation, some of it deserved, for going and saying, here's what we're going to do, right? Here, here's what the technology is. Here's how you're going to apply it uh, without taking into consideration that, you know, finance does stuff different than HR. And HR has different needs than, um, you know, uh, production. And, and those types of silos, I think, are the ones that really are, are most critical. And as I mentioned, with decision intelligence, you can start without totally clean data. Because we all know that, you know, folks have gone in and, and tried to do these data hygiene uh, projects that can almost grind an entire enterprise to a halt. 
because there's it's so complex. You're you're down in the guts of the the business. Um, it takes a long time to figure out. Hey, you know, is this big mass of data over here even worthwhile anymore? Um, so knowing what to keep, what to chuck, uh, all of those things, and that's where these tools, combined with decision intelligence, in my view, uh, give you a real uh, capability to to move forward without sort of having the entire picture in front of you, um, and then and then evolve and, and adapt, as I was saying earlier, as as the situation um, evolves. So. Um, yeah, you want to be able to enable your teams to share their realities with each other so you can come to one common agreement on here's where we are, here's where we're going, um, and here's how we'll get there. And then I think today a lot of service decks lack these tools, right? Even even in situations where the tools have been purchased, they're not necessarily uh, been put in place. Um, you know, we it's, it's a real, uh, I think, art form now is to take these incredibly powerful tools that do all these different things and figure out what do I need them to do. Uh, and I think that um, uh, vendors like like Symphony have an obligation to you know focus very, very strongly on how will these users, how will our customers um, take advantage of the the features and functions that make sense for them um, and and then over time, uh, start to apply some of the more advanced features that are, you know, continuously being added to these machines because you do get an accretion of capabilities and and uh, and tools that uh, make things very very complex. Um, and and unfortunately, instead of adding flexibility in a lot of cases, that starts to uh, decrease flexibility because there's this constant learning curve um, and there's a constant temptation to use the tool. We have it. We spent the money on it. Uh, let's go use it. Uh, without again looking at where are we now, where are we trying to get to, and and what are the resources that we need to uh, to have access to to make that work. Excellent, thank you. Next question is a two-parter. Uh, first, how should an IT service desk approach the opportunity of decision intelligence, and does generative AI have a role to play there? I think it definitely does. Um, again, these, these, you know, if you look at decision intelligence as uh, human beings figuring out what buttons to push, what levers to pull, what are the outside influences that you have control over, what are the outside influences that you do not have control over, um, and and you know bringing that all together into a decision space um, that that enables um, you know uh, both excellent decisions in the moment and then flexibility to evolve as as, as conditions evolve. And I think that uh, Gen AI is one of those tools where. You can use it to say uh, surface insights and 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 um, intelligence that we might not think of, right? It's like the, those aha moments uh, because these tools are so fast. We just, I mean, I, I'm oversimplifying and and I don't mean to be insulting at all, but at the end of the day, these are really really fast adding machines, right? They do ones and zeros and they do them at scale and they do them incredibly quickly, um, much more quickly than we can, which means that they can go out. And and you know look at the entire world these days practically at least as far as the world is captured within the internet uh, and come back so you can ask and especially now that the, the most recent chat um, GPT 4.0 I guess um, demo that that's been going around on online um, wow right this is true natural language you're just asking a question it's like what Siri you know sort of uh, was supposed to be or is probably going to be. Um, just in terms of humans asking questions in the way that they're used to, you know, there's already, we've already gone through this generation of prompt engineering. It's kind of come and gone already, you know, right? For a while there, it was like, oh, you want to advance your career, you better learn how to do prompts for a, uh, for a gen AI system. Um, that's now, you know, we've mo we're moving beyond that. So I can simply ask a question, look, I need to understand what's happening in Malaysia right now. What are the geopolitical factors or what are the you know, economic factors uh you know, what was the impact of that hurricane uh, on us? And and that's where you get that ability to have that gigantic picture and then bring it down, focus it right down onto the needs that you're trying to address as an organization. I think that's where uh, the human and the and the, and the uh, technology combine to create the power of decision intelligence. Yeah, I was watching some of those chat GT GTP4 videos last night. It's uh, pretty amazing. For sure. Yeah. It is, yeah, it's, it truly is. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, some of the other things, um, synthetic yeah. data generation, right? Creating realistic data sets. And I know I watched a couple of the earlier uh, cafes uh, 
and and that was brought up that you know uh, sort of a general purpose uh, Gen AI that's not trained on specific data. First of all, we've all heard about the you know, uh, hallucinations and the uh, delivery of incorrect information, but very confidently delivered. <laughs> it's like uh, what's his right. name from from Cheers, uh, uh, Cliffy, I guess, who always you know had had an answer for everything, but it wasn't necessarily always correct. Um, so being able to to create um, focused data sets and, and operate on those uh, those data sets, you know, in terms of training predictive models for your specific uh, situation, um, we talked about pattern recognition, anomaly uh, detection. Um, and, and being able to get out ahead of events um, for for the users of IT systems is really, really important. Um, what do they say that in IT uh, experiences expectation minus reality? Um, so, you know, the closer you come to, to meeting those expectations uh, and making reality match those expectations, then I think that, you know, again, um, Part of it is making technology disappear as much as possible. I mean, I would argue to some degree that is IT's job, and and it's difficult because the IT guys, uh, the IT folks are are very proud of what they do and they want to share that stuff. But in the end of the day, really, the users just want it to work um, and and not have to to figure out do I even understand what's wrong well enough to put in a ticket, right? So those are, those are the things that slow everything down and and can bring you know entire departments to to a crawl. Um, and then just the natural language processing, ticket categorization, response generation, and uh, I think really, really important, that process of capturing the knowledge that is created every single day just in doing IT service management, in delivering the services, hearing from the users, um, you know, continuously uh, evolving and, and improving on it. Um, that's an area where I think Gen.I is incredibly powerful. And, and what's important, I think, is, you know, a lot of this stuff leads to cost optimization. But if you start from cost rather than stop starting from optimization, you're making a mistake. The cost benefits will come simply by removing five minutes per interaction that now is put into somehow capturing what's going on, typing it up, putting it into the knowledge base. Somebody else has to go in, clean it up, see what's there. Is it there already? Is this a better version of what? And that's where these tools, I think, are incredibly powerful, Gen I specifically, Gen AI specifically. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what's the potential for generative AI for IT service desk analytics and reporting including some extended generative AI, AI analytics and reporting use cases that we could be exploring in the future? Well, again, I think that the the, the ability to sort of uh, see into the future, um, pattern recognition, um, the ability to contrast and compare and understand, you know, uh, the hidden um, implications uh, of, of those patterns is, Probably the you know currently the the most powerful capability that these tools to uh, bring um, over time I think real time coaching right so at the end of the day and this is goes beyond way well beyond IT uh, and IT service delivery um, to let's think about call centers right you've got folks especially in a, a more you know, we think of call centers as being sort of the folks who answer when we have a problem with our with our credit card or um, you know, somebody who's uh, tracking and, you know, is going to uh, help you calm down when you can't figure out where your where your package is and that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, the most complex companies in the world also have call centers that are dealing with engineers, they're dealing with electricians, they're dealing with, you know, any, any, uh, uh, any human activity, um, some of them extremely complex. Um, and it takes a long time to learn what's required to be an effective uh, contact center uh, agent in those situations. Um, and, and more importantly, it takes a long time to get confident because if you're not confident, you're not happy. And if you're not happy, you're not going to stick around. Um, and that means the investment in your training and all the rest of it goes out the window when you when you walk uh, simply because, you know, people say they don't quit jobs, they quit, you know, bosses, they quit broken systems, they quit all of those things. Well, that's where I think, um, you know, you start to apply some of these Gen AI to sort of like in your ear coaching. Um, now you've got this massive database that's been cleaned and continuously cleaned and much more powerful and, and uh, um, you know, up to date. Um, so the the agent or the, you know, IT service desk uh, uh, agent, whoever it is, 
is able to hear in real time with some coaching going on in their ear as they're interacting with the with their client. Um, and as we've seen, you know, these newer systems or these latest iterations of these systems can pick up on, you know, the pattern of breathing, the language used, the tone that's used, all of those things and help guide, um, you know, the folks who are dealing with other human beings uh, in maximizing and optimizing that interaction. That, that's just massively uh, valuable. It saves time. Um, the outcomes are better. The the end user is happier, uh, and all of those things uh, contribute directly and very strongly to success. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Uh, final question: What tips do you have for this for a service desk leader trying to make a compelling case for improving their analytics and reporting? And does that include generative AI? Well, I think the first thing that we would uh, tell them to do is uh, you know show this uh, show this webinar. To the leadership um, and, and all the other webinars you've been doing, because I think we talk about all these things. It's it's ROI um, beyond, uh, of course. You know, money is at the end of the day the the the, the uh, core of what we're doing this all for is to, to be successful financially. But um, that is the outcome. That is not the goal at the end of the day. It's the goal, but it's not you know the driving um, uh, purpose uh, for most organizations. So. You really need to show uh, how are these analytics and efficiencies and, uh, you know, uh, all these capabilities that we've been talking about, how do they improve user satisfaction? Um, and then that leads to the discussion of why is that important, which, you know, what, what we just talked about. You're talking about happier, more effective, uh, more efficient uh, employees, and all of that contributes directly to the bottom line. Focus on all those improvements. Cost op optimization will be the outcome, and these these tools can help you demonstrate that, obviously, right? And again, they give you the capability to speak in the language that you need to speak to uh, for the audience that you're addressing. Um, uh, these Gen AI tools, right now, you can do pilot projects, you can do small scale experiments. You don't have to take this. You better not actually take you know some of these Gen AI tools and, and some of the you know powerful tools that that. Uh, uh, folks like Symphony are bringing to the, the market and and just go in and, and uh, you know, implement them uh, across an entire enterprise. That's insane. Uh, the, the level of disruption that, that comes uh, will probably wipe out any near-term uh, ROI uh, on, on those types of projects. So I think, you know, the ability to start small uh, and then scale up as you learn and as the, the system learns as well, because that's the other thing. These are now learning systems. Um, so that is is, you know, a way to showcase some of the power of this stuff. So it goes, you know, it goes beyond Tableau. It goes beyond, you know, a, a dashboard. It goes beyond a bunch of uh, interesting uh, charts and, and gives you a level of, of capability that's much, much more powerful. But again, you need to be able to demonstrate that at sort of a human scale so that people can get their heads around it and then start to imagine, you know, what, what can be done at a larger scale. Uh, larger scale. Um, and then, Stakeholder engagement, right? So I mentioned in the context of decision intelligence, one of its most powerful features, or, or um, I guess we'll just use features, uh, is that it is inherently collaborative. So these tools can help you not only share these knowledges and, and, and share reality and come to agreement, they can also help you understand who you need to talk to. Let's think about this. If I do this, it's going to impact here, here, and here. And these are all value chains, right? We don't—they're not even value chains anymore. I think the, you know, thinking of it in value streams is much more effective because these are all merging, impacting each other, and then splitting off of each other again. And those are the types of patterns that we can imagine, but we, as human beings, it's very difficult to really see and keep in our heads. And these tools can really show that to say, if then, if we do this, what are our requirements going to be? What are the impacts going to be? What are the potential negatives? And we can plan ahead, and we can be ready for those. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of negatives you can't uh, you can't prevent, but you can certainly adapt to and be ready for. And I think these tools are incredibly valuable for that. Excellent, so, thank you. Absolutely, Tim. So uh, I'm going to turn the tables a little bit. Um, you know, I used to sit in your chair a lot, uh, certainly when <laughs> I was within Forma. Uh, you know, asking the questions, but I, I like to flip that around, and I'd like to talk to. I'd like you to talk to uh, a little bit about how has Symphony AI specifically been leveraging these kinds of capabilities that we've been talking about, AI, 
um, decision intelligence. I'd like to hear, you know, sort of how they define and think about decision intelligence. And, you know, what, what are they doing to continuously improve their, their, their solutions and enhance customer analytics and, and reporting specifically? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'd love to give a demo of, of the product, but before, we, before I do that, I will uh, jump into a, a quick little slide deck about Symphony AI. Fantastic. A little bit about Symphony AI. Uh, we're building the leading generative and predictive enterprise AI. Uh, we're doing that throughout multiple divisions. We have a retail and consumer packaged goods divisions, a financial services division, industrial, and then I represent the enterprise IT. And here you can see our vision and our mission statement as well. Uh, so some of our customer base you can see through our different divisions here. Um, some great logos here. We have 30 of the 50 top grocery retailers. We've got 25 of the 25 top CPG companies and 33 of the top financial institutions. And under enterprise IT, you can see some great logos there. Harman International, Trellix, McAfee, KPMG, et cetera. A little more specifically about enterprise IT, some of the awards and recognitions that we have. We have we've won Gartner Peer Insights customer choice five years in a row. We're very happy about that. Our customer base is very satisfied. Uh, CIO choice six years in a row. ISG provider lens. We're in the top right quadrant there. And again, some of more of our uh, diverse customer base. And then you can see some more of our awards and recognitions. And now this is kind of an overview of our enterprise IT platform itself. So the function, obviously, any uh, enterprise service management platform nowadays has to support all functions across any organization. So not just IT, but human resources, facilities, finance, et cetera. Our systems of engagement, we, we want to meet those end users or those folks that we're supporting, the consumers and customers, wherever they're going to work. So obviously we have an interactive uh, self-service portal, but we also have integrations with Microsoft Teams, Slack, Google Chat, WhatsApp for business. We can support uh, multiple phone providers, um, and we have a mobile application for Android and for iOS as well. Our systems of intelligence, we have intent identification, intent classification, workload management, intelligent self-service, and automation. So that kind of goes into what we were talking about there uh, with the intent uh, identification and classification. So we can make intelligent decisions within the platform itself, and we can automatically use our AI technology to uh, classify the incident, dictate the priority, the impact, who it should be assigned to, what work group should it be assigned to, the category, the subcategory, et cetera. So that way we're automatically tagging all of those correctly on the incident, which that then leads to better reporting in the end. And also obviously saves a lot of time from the analyst perspective, instead of having to go through and make those decisions themselves, the platform can make those decisions intelligently, automatically apply them. And then that leads to, uh, to, to future um, efficiencies there. So our solution stack includes IT service management, obviously, enterprise service management, IT and enterprise asset management, service automation, which goes along uh, really well with our co-pilot. So service automation is going to provide those zero touch situations where you can fully automate uh, the, the fulfillment of requests or the resolution of incidents. Um, as long as we have those scripts built into the platform themselves, then we have a lot of our customers that are, are fully automating a lot of their service desk, which is freeing up resources for other projects. Um, here's our new Apex platform. Our Apex platform was released in December of last year. So we're very, very excited about this. Uh, it's, it's meant for multiple personas, as you can see on top there. <clears throat> kind of the cornerstone of this Apex platform is our co-pilot. Um, this co-pilot can not only sit in our platform, it can also sit on Microsoft Teams, Slack. It can also be an independent product as well. So we can actually have this sitting on other ITSM platforms as well. Um, and we, we support different applications within the system. So this is something that's new with this platform is instead of having modules, uh, specifically like ITSM modules, we can support different applications now. So these applications allow the platform to be much more flexible. We're now solving for use cases that are kind of completely outside of the realm of ITSM. We're working with major retailers to help them solve uh, their security workflow issues, which is creating a police report that can be ingested by the local police department when they have security problems at their grocery stores. So there's a ton of flexibility here, which we're really, really excited about. 
And the whole co-pilot is built on their, your, our proprietary Eureka AI platform, which has our proprietary um, machine learning models, our large language models, and our predictive and contextual intelligence on the back end there. <clears throat> the Apex platform, I actually just call it no code. Uh, the entire platform can be modified uh, by anybody. You don't need a coding background whatsoever. So we give you the frameworks out of the box. But that being said, if you don't like what you see, the entire platform is click, drag, and drop. You can add fields, remove fields. Let's say it's a human resource uh, situation or a use case, and uh, they don't want SLAs. We can just completely remove SLAs for the platform. So incredibly flexible there. And then this kind of dives into more of our key capabilities. So IT service management, we're a single tenant platform. So each customer gets their own database and application server. But within that, it's multi-tenancy, which means that you can support multiple departments within a single organization and they can each have their own uh, siloed areas of the platform. Or if it's a multi-service provider situation, the multi-service provider can support each of their customers individually within the platform itself. And we uh, expand across obviously different different uh, departments across the organization. We have enterprise IT asset management, the service automation and that generative co-pilot that I was talking about there. So here's some cool statistics uh, from our customers as well. Going back to that service automation, we've had some folks uh, uh, completely automate 65% of the service requests that are coming in. And when you think about an organization, this actually comes from Harmony International. <clears throat> they've got tens of thousands of employees and you multiply that by the number of service requests that they're getting and if they can automate 65 percent of those fully that frees up a ton of time for the service desk to start working on other other areas as well over a 50 percent faster resolution um, going through our ai service desk and a 30 percent reduction in hardware and software inventory costs as well so that's a brief overview of uh Symphony AI and Enterprise IT. Okay, so now we've jumped into the Apex platform and I've logged in as Ryan, Ryan's an end user. So this is just an example of our service portal um, and going along with that service desk intelligence, I'm just gonna click on raise a technology issue. And from the end user's perspective, some of the intelligence that we're gonna offer is actually gonna be uh, ticket deflection. So we want to hopefully solve this end user's problem before they're actually submitting uh, the, the request um, as it comes in. So as you can see here, I'm filling out the incident and I'm getting suggested solutions here as well. So this is informing the end user of uh, different solutions that we can have here. And as I start typing, you can see that the dynamically change there. Now, hopefully I can just click on one of these and view the steps and actually solve my own issue without submitting that service catalog request. So that's kind of step one of our service desk intelligence that we have there. And next I'm gonna log in as the analyst and show you from the analyst point of view. Yeah, that's great stuff because it, it, it uh, answers both um, folks who who just want a, a solution that they can figure out and, and it also satisfies folks like me um, that you know want to feel some control over the situation mm -hmm. and in the past I was dangerous because I'd go in and do things uh, that perhaps weren't uh, exactly what the IT team would sure. want me to do and then, <laughs> then they're fixing they're fixing my fix so yeah that's great stuff yeah so now I've logged in as Maxwell Maxwell is an analyst uh, within our apex platform so if I jump into an incident right now the system is analyzing the incident, and this is part of our AI suggestions right here. So our service desk intelligence. So this is automatically suggesting the work group, the impact, the urgency, the category, and the classification. <clears throat> and if I think those are correct, I can just quickly simple, click apply there. And now that's already gone through and uh, automatically applied those different data points to this platform, or sorry, to this incident, I should say. So now it's in the right hands. It's it's along to the right team. I can pick the analyst that I want this to be assigned to, but that has saved me, you know, four or five different manual steps I would have to take before. And those steps would be actually things that I have to put my thought process into, right? So which work group does this need to be assigned to? What's the impact, the urgency, the classification, et cetera. So that's kind of step one there. If I go to the solution, 
Let me put this into in progress here. Oops, we've breached our SLA. Hang on. <laughs> Just the, I'm just curious, like in the symptom and decision, right? So there's a couple of typos in there. Uh, instead of cannot access, says connect access, uh, having yeah. issues connecting to the VPN connection. Is it is it able to you know handle that kind of you know ambiguity to to sort of understand? Yeah. Here's what you, you know. <clears throat> yeah, that's 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 uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Our LLM is is really powerful. You can kind of, I mean, you can misspell things and put words in different order and stuff like that within a sentence. And uh, it's still going to understand. That's great. Yeah, because yeah. when you work when you're working at speed, you know, uh, and Lord knows I'm I'm not a touch typist, so I'm constantly looking yeah, at my same. fingers. And I look up and say, "Oh Lord, what did I just type?" So, right. Uh, that's, that's that's great. Yeah, these tools are incredibly incredibly powerful. It's yeah, it's it's, it's really really amazing. As you can see, I've been around for a while, so. Uh, uh, just to see this this evolution is is fantastic. Yeah, no, this is really exciting stuff. Okay, another thing I wanted to show you, Tim, is our uh, insights that we can create from our copilot. So within an incident, I can click on our copilot icon on the top right hand corner there, and this is actually reading the incident, giving me a summary of what is detected, giving me investigation and interaction uh, performance analytics as well reading the sentiment, which I think is really cool too. So we, it can pick up whether that end user is disgruntled, whether they're neutral, you know, they're satisfied, et cetera. And then it's giving me suggestions on how to fix this issue and then also letting me know the potential risk of ex escalation as well. So this one is low, this seems to be a single impact. Um, so this again, gives you great insight. I think this can be a fantastic training tool for new employees as well, because mm -hmm. if they come in, they're not quite sure how to support those end users. They haven't interacted with them on a personal basis. This can give them a lot of fantastic insights. And as you can see, that that populates us with, with, within a matter of seconds. Yep. So next, I'm going to show you our copilot through Teams as well, just kind of going into data and analytics. And I'll populate that here. So this is our uh, integration with Microsoft Teams. So this can obviously sit, this is in my desktop application, but I think this is really, really powerful if you're like me and you're on the go all the time and you've got your cell phone you know, glued to your hand. Uh, this Copilot can come along with me. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, if I wake up on a Monday morning and I just got back from vacation, the first thing I'm gonna do is, is you know, look at my cell phone, see what messages I have. But then perhaps I want to know what am I in for? What's happened in the last like week or two that I was out? Um, and instead of having to jump into a platform and run reports or wait for someone to run those reports for me, I can simply open up Teams on my phone and ask the copilot itself. So I'll ask how many P1 tickets. So how many P1 tickets did we have in the last 30 days? And do you see any trends? So I want to make sure that I'm on top of what's happening within my environment. Uh, and so that way I can answer any questions that uh, that come up when I return to work there. Or I already know the answers to the questions that I would ask when I would usually show up on a Monday morning. 
So this is going through and analyzing the data and it'll, it'll give me a summary of what's taken place. And then what I can do from there is if I want this as a report that I can distribute to folks, I can simply ask the copilot to create a report for me. Yeah, well. Wow. So it looks like we've had 10 P1 tickets. It's given me kind of a breakdown on what it sees for trends and observations. And then it's asking me, do I want to have a graphical represent representation of this trend? So I'll say yes. And this is going to generate a report in real time that I can then send off to folks. And what's also cool about this too, is we actually have this plugged into uh, into Outlook. So I can go through and I can request a meeting with somebody and this mm -hmm. can actually facilitate and send that meeting request out and it'll populate on both of our calendars, which is really impressive. Yeah, and, and it looks like with, you know, somewhat of an agenda attached, right? So yeah, that's I, I exactly that, it. There, there's the meeting uh, invitation and there's what we're going to, what we need to talk about. That's great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And you can pick the platform you want the meeting to take place on. So whether it's Teams or Zoom, anything like that. But as you can see here in a matter of seconds, <clears throat> I got my question answered in an intelligent way, um, leading, to, you know, leading to more service desk intelligence. And then boom, here's a report for me that I can take a look at. So really, really powerful stuff here. Yeah, that's incredible. Think about, you know, as I was saying, you know, you know, you have Tableau experts and you're going to talk to them and hope that they understand what it is you're looking to get done. Uh, they're going to turn around, send you a report. You're going to say, "Ah, eh, no, we need to, you know, the different focus. I didn't get, you know, I didn't make myself clear uh, back and forth, right. back and forth. And, and the uh, the quality of the outcome, the output is is typically not what it could be. And certainly the mm -hmm. timeliness, the timeliness suffers. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So to wrap up here, Tim, um, for ITSM professionals wanting to improve their analytics and reporting capabilities and success, what do you think they should focus on? So, um, you know, I said from the beginning, first of all, they need to work very closely with their uh, tool vendors, uh, their platform vendors or solution vendors to make sure that uh, everybody is in agreement on what is it we're trying to accomplish. Only then can you then apply a tool, no matter how powerful, to solving those specific issues and challenges that you're facing as an IT support desk and as an organization. Um, talent development, I think, is huge, um, and I think these these tools. And we didn't talk about this, but there's that training aspect to these tools, where they are, um, you know, capable of helping uh, new employees come up to speed very quickly and helping uh, longer-term employees to continuously improve their capabilities uh, and, and their value to the organization. So I think that that's huge. Um, so training and hiring uh, folks who who uh, understand how to optimize these systems is, is going to be very, very important. We talked about data quality and integration, uh, data accuracy, integrating disparate data sources, um, being able to move forward with less than perfect data. Uh, those are the types of things that I think are, are, are really critical. Um, and, and teaching people that they don't need to have, uh, you know, a perfectly clean data lake uh, that's been, you know, uh, uh, hygienized, that's not the word, but we'll go with it, um, you know, and, and pulled together um, and, and understanding where those silos are and starting to break them down, not like through brute force, but through collaboration and cooperation uh, and then continuous improvement. Right. So these these tools uh, enable that continuous improvement. As you said, you can see what's happening. You can look into the future a little bit. You can prepare for um, events before they even happen. Uh, you can see things like we're having a problem with UI, and using the example that you just showed, um, which lets us, you know, uh, apply resources to those problems, um, you know, in in advance. Uh, so I think that those are the types of things that um, really uh, need uh, IT professionals need to be focused on as they're uh, assessing tools like Symphony AI. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Tim. Uh, as they say, two Tims are better than one. I think we proved that on this on this uh, workflow cafe. So thank you so much for your time. This is a fantastic conversation. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, if you want to come check us out, we're at symphonyai.com. See you next time.